In this video, we are gonna talk about off-season training in the sport of CrossFit. I'm gonna cover some major themes and give you some detail on how it is done with elite athletes. What you're about to watch is video one from our classroom series, Off-Season Training in the Sport of CrossFit. If you wanna see my full template for elite athletes or see Adam Rogers break down intermediate athletes or Kyle Ruth break down masters athletes, head over to trainingthinktank.com slash classroom trial for a seven day free trial to check it out. When it comes to off-season training, I get a lot of common questions. So let's start with some of the most common questions. So first, why is there an off-season? There's a major move in the sport of CrossFit or the, I guess, the influencers of the CrossFit market that will talk about not having an off-season, keeping it simple, always doing CrossFit. I think that is a major mistake. One of the keys to learning and gaining experiential wisdom in any sport or any craft is having periods of time where you're immersed in it and then periods of time where you step away from that immersion and have the opportunity to process, reflect, learn, and then go back into that same level of immersion, but as a wiser, more intelligent athlete. And I think that cyclical rhythm of sports with every sport, I mean, if you see it in basketball, soccer, football, Every sport has a season where you're fully immersed and where you're super intense, and then a period of time where you step back and you take a little bit of a break. So I think that having an off season is super important for your body to be able to just decompress, especially in CrossFit. There's a lot of loading, there's a lot of intense aerobic work, there's a lot of uh, impact on all of your joints. And I think just having some period of time to decompress is important, but additionally to the body, like our corpus animus philosophy, making sure that your mind can get away from the sport, can get out of the gym, can think about yourself, can watch videos of yourself, and just process everything that happened so you can go into the next season with some sort of an upgraded plan of attack is a beneficial way to make sure that you're getting better year after year after year. What you see commonly with people that just you know put the throttle down and keep it down for five, six years is you can have these progress curves where you're keeping getting better because you're just doing it. But you have these periods of time when you get to the end where you hit some sort of a big plateau because you've had some sort of dysfunction or some sort of pattern that wasn't optimal and your inefficiencies become your major limiter because you never really st stepped back and figured out how to start from square one and move forward. So hopefully that's enough of a sales pitch to explain to you that it is important. I employ it with all of my elite athletes. I've employed it with athletes that are not at the elite level. As athletes like Matt Frazier step out of retirement, he's talked about having big off seasons. So I'm a huge proponent of it being a necessary aspect of training. So hopefully that's enough to convince you. What is an off season? So an off season can be different for different types of people. It could be a period of time where you're just completely disconnected from the gym. So an elite athlete, say they go through a six month training block, they get to the games, they do well at the games and then they finish and they're just exhausted from the buildup, the training, the process, the media, everything that happened. Their off season might be a period of time where they're just completely disconnected and stepped away. Now for somebody who's an intermediate, their season might only have been the three weeks in the open. So going through that three weeks is stressful, but it might only require three to 10 days of downtime before you're back in the gym and starting the process of development again. That off-season process for them is going to be a little bit more foundational development in the gym and actually kind of resemble training that's a little bit less sport specific. So the what of an off-season is a lot more dependent based on the athlete, their experience, their training age, their biological age, their why, and all of those variables will contribute to determining what is an appropriate off-season for that specific athlete. Jumping into how long, that is another depends answer. So I alluded to the fact that a CrossFit Games athlete could have potentially a six month long season, or they could have a, if we start the open this year in February and we go all the way through the games in July, 
and then there's off-season competitions that run in November and December, you could potentially have a 10-month long season with a three-month long off-season between that competition in November and the next season. So your actual off-season window could be condensed very, very, very substantially for an elite athlete, whereas somebody who's just like, hey, I compete in the open, I find it recreational, I enjoy the process, I love the fact that I can get on the leaderboard and test myself and there'll be some sort of a repeat in every open so I can test my fitness and make sure it's improving, but that season's only three weeks long and you do a little bit of preparation beforehand, that off season could be 10 to 11 months long. So those are very, very, very different off season concepts and styles of training, which is why I'm gonna break down elite athletes in this video and then we'll cover intermediates and masters athletes who will have a little bit of a different process in the classroom. Then in CrossFit, when is the off season? This is a hard question to ask. So if you've been involved in CrossFit for a period of time, or if you haven't, the sport is quite chaotic. I mean, I think unknown and unknowable is one of the taglines of the sport. It means we are literally training for something that we don't know what we're training for. And that includes the actual competition structure. So there have been a series of years where there was an open that qualified you to the next step, which was regionals, which was an in-person competition. If you finish high enough in that competition in person, then you qualified for the CrossFit Games and competed. Then we, in 2000, in 19, we created, not we created, they created a systematic change where you could qualify directly from the open into the CrossFit Games. This season, we've reverted back to something that resembles that regional structure, although they're calling it Continentals, where you have the open, you qualify through to a secondary open, which is a stage two qualifier, which is again in the gym. If you finish high enough in that, then you pass on to what they call semifinals, which is similar to the old school regionals, which is an in-person competition. If you finish high enough in that, you go to the games. So there is a season process from February to July this year for elite athletes. And if you're not an elite athlete, it could be from February to March. If you're a master's athlete, it could be February to May. But essentially, whenever the peak point of your training ends, so if you're an athlete that says, hey, I'm focusing on the open, I wanna do as well as possible, I'm not gonna move on. Right at, at that moment is when you're trying to peak your total fitness and your total level of emotional investment and physical investment in the sport. Right after that is when your off season kicks in. So that period of time throughout the year is gonna be different. You also have to have some sort of a context. So with specific athletes, if they're at the professional level, they're gonna go through the season, they might actually have an a off-season competition series lined up that then leads into the next season. So you could potentially go through a training season that lasts for 18 months or for two years before you take a prolonged big off-season. And that's very dependent on the athlete's earnings, whether they have to go to these competitions, whether they wanna improve themselves at in-person competitions and get practice, or whether their focus is more on qualifiers. So the structure of when is also very very dependent upon the athlete. So that's answering the common questions. I know there was a lot of depends in there, depends on athletic level, and to solve that depends answer, to give a little bit more clarity so that I don't leave it vague, I'm gonna cover an example of an elite athlete, then we'll dive into some intermediate and masters athletes in other videos, which will give you some sort of an understanding of how these depends answers play out as we get into more granulated detail with the specific athletes. Some tips as we talk about training in off seasons. Number one, and I put three exclamation points in here to make sure that it is very, 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 very clear that you should make sure that you correct dysfunction in your off season. It's a huge mistake in CrossFit that is made all the time that people have very dysfunctional movement patterns and they add capacity to it. So, you know, let's say it's a squat snatch and somebody is very clearly raising their hips way off the off the um, off their spine angle too quickly, the bar's getting ahead, they're looping, diving under, and jumping forward six inches, and it is clearly not just an inefficient pattern, but something that's dis dysfunctional, and that can lead them to injury, and will create the ceiling of what they're able to lift, 
But in CrossFit, there's this mentality that, oh, just work hard, get intensity, don't worry about being too much of a specialist because we're just trying to get good at generalist skills. There's something to that concept and that ideology, but that ideology, if taken too far, can lead you to injury and blunt your athletic ceiling really quickly. So your off season is your time to fix and correct dysfunctional movement patterns. Doesn't mean you're gonna move precisely and correctly and like a professional athlete every time you go through an off season, but it means that's the time to slow down work on technique, work on refining your movement patterns. So make sure that you're, appropriate, you're appropriately putting people's headspace into the, I'm trying to correct and learn and slow down and be a better mover in those times when you go into off-season training. Second is be adaptive. When I create teaching material like this and when I lay out some sort of a periodization model for you to understand how I look at training, it looks like I have this super systematic process that's always regimented and refined, but when you actually get into the real world, you have to be adaptive. You create those plans, you start training, somebody gets a tweak, then you have to create a new structure to the plan, you started with this training progression, the athlete's not enjoying it, so you have to switch to another one. So this process of being adaptive is is part of the development of appropriate off seasons, but that probably applies to just training people in general. You wanna make sure that you're feeling very comfortable adapting to whatever your original plan is. Not saying, I put this plan down and now it's my gospel and we're following it to the T without any adjustments. Think if you do that in the sport of CrossFit or in the realm of CrossFit, because there are so many stressors imposed on the system, you're more likely to just burn athletes out than you are to allow them to create long-term progress for themselves. Third would be balance, simplicity, and complexity. So I understand when you're talking training in CrossFit, Sometimes it can be overwhelming. You're talking about trying to integrate philosophies of training from weightlifting, from powerlifting, from gymnastics, from endurance sports, from uh, skill sports like jump roping, and you're integrating all of that knowledge into one collective sport and trying to create models of development so somebody can get better at all of those things all at once. That is a super complex problem. So what people generally do is try to simplify that. And some of the simplified concepts are like, oh, well just do CrossFit. If you need to get better at double unders, just put double unders in a Metcon. I think there is a balance. And if you become too simplified in your concepts, you are likely not gonna get people better. If you become too complicated and you're talking about too much scientific theory or too much perfection of weightlifting technique or too much perfection of the basic levels of gymnastics and you're trying to get the perfect training structure and trying to time every single carbohydrate and every single timing of how much water you're drinking and every variable is trying to be perfect, you're gonna overcomplicate the issue, you're gonna burn the athletes out from just the overall cognitive stress of thinking about too many things. So this is a balancing act as you go through when you're a coach and when you're writing training programs that are specifically designed for athletes, what do you communicate to them versus what do you keep to yourself? How do you communicate in the most simple way, but also make them understand some of the complexity of thought that went into giving them a structure that they feel confident is gonna get them better? So those are my three tips as we jump into it. I have this boiled down into, as we, you know, I'm jumping off my simplicity concept, into three basic steps when you're trying to create an off season. First is going to be identify priorities and organize. A model that we have is trying to take those priorities and put them in three different buckets. The first bucket is sport specific priorities. So if you go through the open or you go through a semifinal or you go through the games or you go to an off season competition, the leaderboard is one of your best sources of data. You can go in there, say you finished fifth place on one workout, third place on another and 15th place on that last workout, that 15th place is a very clear weakness relative to the field. So when you go through every season, there should be some retroactive analysis looking at all your leaderboards, coming up with very clear sport-specific weaknesses that you need to organize on your training so that you can get better at. Second would be individual training priorities. This could be something like you have a collective group of data. So for at Training Think Tank, we have, a, 
we've had a ton of athletes that have gotten to stage two or to the CrossFit games or to a regional level when regionals was a thing still. And we use that data to try to figure out, okay, well, let's do some gymnastics tests. Let's do an AMRAP unbroken handstand push-up test. Let's do 100 handstand push-ups for time. Let's do 20 snatches for time at 77%. And we've aggregated tests over time that we give to all of our athletes to say, hey, individually, you are very weak at this relative to our big group of athletes that are competing. This is not necessarily going to be a test in CrossFit. Doing 77% of your one rep max snatch for 20 reps is not gonna be a test in CrossFit because generally they select a weight. They don't base it based off of what your one rep max is. But that can tell us what an athlete's capacity is relative to their one rep max expression. So it gives us some individual training priorities to work on in addition to the sport specific priorities. And then the final is athlete input. There is a process of communication and a philosophy that we have at TTT that's trying to create an athlete-centric model of training, which essentially means that we're putting the athlete at the center of our process. And that means that they're gonna have some input. They might go through a workout, they might get crushed in it, they might wanna work on it, they might say things like, hey, I feel better when I'm doing X amount of a, you know easy aerobic work every day in my training, or hey, when I don't touch this specific movement for you know multiple times a week, it really starts to deteriorate quickly. So we take all that athlete input at the end of a season, we combine it with our individual training priorities, and then we combine it with our sport priorities. When we get that list then of all the different priorities in our three different buckets, then we create a template and we create a season planning structure. This is essentially periodization. I'm gonna cover that a little bit in this video, and then we'll dive into detail in the classroom in the program design series where I create a template on Elite, Adam will do Intermediate, and Kyle will do uh, Masters Athletes. Then, after you get that kind of big picture stuff done, step three is actually writing the training and getting started with training. So I need a quick break to wipe this down and start and explain some basic concepts of templating and then show you some example training in the off season for elite athletes. All right, I'm back, new whiteboard content. So we are going to cover the principles of step two and three, which is creating a template and a season plan, and then creating specific training sessions that match up to that template. So the way that we like to explain the different styles of off-season is with our limiter bridge performance concept. In the classroom, we have a full series on that, but as a general rule of thumb, the way that I like to think about it is, in limiter training, or what we would call off-season one, because it kind of happens in stages, what you're gonna focus on most is positions and movement. Think of this like the base of your pyramid. The wider you get this base in your off season, so the more technically efficient you can be in weightlifting, the better your gymnastics positions, the better you understand your breathing and how to breathe when you're doing cyclical stuff, the better your peak when you get later into the competitive season or when you actually compete is going to be. So off season stage one is figuring out what are the lowest hanging fruits that you can kind of pick off and start to improve? You don't, you're not gonna improve your ability to hit five continuous max effort Metcons in one day and, and dial in your competitive mind state and all of that if you don't have a foundation of good technique, good movement, good fueling. So off season one is limiter training where you're focused on that. It's a little bit more basic training focused. Off season two is bridge. And bridge is basically meaning you're taking all of this basic training stuff that you did that is just improving your mind and your body and you're starting to bridge the gap to trying to get yourself into applying those gains into competition or into sport. So here is where you start adding loading and volume. So if you were working on the technique of your Olympic lifting, maybe with an empty barbell or with a PVC pipe in your off season, one, where you're working on limiter training, as you bridge into your competitive season, you might start actually hitting percentage-based lifts. You might be doing you know, snatches at 80%, working on your timing, your rhythm, your first pull, your technique, video review, and actually starting to accumulate some reps. So that would be bridge training or off-season two. 
off season three would be getting into performance training. And in the performance side of it, now you're actually working on sport expression. So I've done videos before where we've talked about Olympic weightlifting in the sport of CrossFit and barbell cycling and lifting under fatigue. And if you just did op the open of 2021, 21.4 was doing a complex lifting, so it's definitely not one of the straight weightlifting movements, like it's not snatch or clean and jerk, it was deadlift into a clean, into a hand clean, into a jerk, very different than a normal lift, and you only had seven minutes to do it after you just did a full series of three different Metcons back to back with a one minute rest between them. So that's where we start to actually practice sport expression and doing those more complex, more risky styles of training. That model of having off season one or limiter training, off season two or bridge training, or off season three and performance training is true and applies to all levels of athletes. So you can put people through this limiter bridge performance concept, whether they're an elite athlete, a beginner athlete, an intermediate athlete, a master's athlete. But going back to the questions, the common questions that we talked about, when you do it, how long you do it, what movements go into them, that is all going to be dependent upon the specific athlete that you're talking about and what they specifically need to work on and what their season is actually going to look like. To see full templates, we put them in the classroom. I created mine for elites, which I'm gonna cover basically here with regards to individual training sessions. I'll walk you through the example priorities that I laid out and then I'll give you some training sessions and then in the classroom I'll actually show you the full map of what that looks like in a full training week in each one of these three off-season styles and then Adam covers intermediate, Kyle covers masters. So if we move into elite athletes, I needed to make up some assumptions. So the assumption that I'm gonna make here is that we just have three training priorities and one of them from each of the buckets that I just talked about. So the first bucket would be sport specific and we're gonna say that that priority is complex lifting under fatigue. So they got really, really exposed in 21.4. So that'd be our first priority that we work on. Our second priority would be an individual priority, which would be shoulder flexion. Flexion in the shoulder is arms overhead, so let's say that that movement comes out in the jerk, you know, which might be related to the complex lifting under fatigue, maybe in the wall walks, because you have to feel comfortable pushing away and getting your arms stacked over your head. Um, it could be limiting in handstand walking, it could be limiting in the kip swing of muscle ups or toes to bar. So that specific movement, which I'm putting here in my example, but it's also something very common in regular everyday people that are trying to be involved in CrossFit, is you have very limited shoulder flexion and no ability to get your arms over your head because we sit like this and type, we do this, we're on our phones all the time, so our arms aren't really necessarily taken overhead very often, so that limitation is very common and it holds people back in the sport, so I thought it would make sense to put in here in this example. And then the third, the athlete input priority would be wall walks and double unders because that combo blew me up. So that is basically what they told me. These are the three things that I'm mapping out in training and I'm gonna explain the training sessions as we move from limiter training into bridge training and then into performance training. So I'll start with the first, complex lifting under fatigue. If somebody needs to get better at lifting under fatigue, that also means that they should be stronger. So if you wanna be able to lift, let's say you hit 225 in the complex in 21.4 and you wanna be able to hit 275, the likelihood is if you put 50 pounds on your clean and jerk, it's probably going to transfer into you being able to lift more in that complex under fatigue, even though you're not actually practicing that specific complex. So there's a kind of a two-prong approach when it comes to getting better at lifting under fatigue. There's just the technique and absolute strength of just like getting stronger, and then there's also the actually dealing with the fatigue to be able to maintain that technique under fatigue. So training in my limiter phase might look like very straight strength work. So here I have three by three snatch pulls at 105%, and then I have four sets of eight back squats at 65%, which is similar to the start of a hatch cycle because that's pretty familiar to a lot of coaches out there. Then I have three five minute EMOMs. And the EMOMs are all different complexes. So the first one is power snatch times one, hang power snatch times one, hang squat snatch. 
The second is power clean, hang power clean, hang squat clean, front squat. And then the last is push press, push jerk, split jerk. So when somebody says, I wanna get better at complex lifting under fatigue, a major mistake that people can make in CrossFit is getting exposed in a singular test in one season, then governing their training around that singular test and getting better in that one test, only to find out the next year that's not part of the testing body, or if they test something kind of similar, you're not really better at it because you only focused on one thing. So when you get exposed in a specific test, you wanna try to zoom out and figure out what are the themes of what would make me better at a test like this? So that way I can organize my training in a way that's gonna get me better at if this test gets repeated or if something, anything similar to this gets repeated. So the themes that I think of are holding on to the barbell, doing the non-traditional lifts. There's a lot of people out there that have very good snatch and very good clean and jerk form technique cues and have been coached very well, but they don't do a lot of complexes where you have to take the bar from the front grab rack, re-grip it into the hang position, do a deadlift first before your first pull of the clean, Getting used to doing all those different variations together is the theme, and the major movements that you're gonna see are basically the snatch variations, the clean variations, and the shoulder to overhead variations. So I put all three of those into my EMOMs. So that would be limiter style training for priority number one. As I moved into bridge, what you'll see is the snatch pulls, I'm just basically creating progressions, and this could be this could be a six week block, an eight week block of training. This could be a six to eight week block of training. And this could be a three week block of training as an example. So I'm not making this progression from one training session to the next, but let's just say, as I get through this progression, my snatch pulls are basically just up to 110% of my 1RM. And hopefully at that point, if this training cycle was successful, that 110% is not just 5% more uh, heavy, it's actually more than that because they've also PR'd their lift. If not, then you've just basically created 5% of progression over time with the athlete. And that actually could be a good amount of progress for an elite athlete. I know that's hard to say, hey, you're training for 12 weeks to put 5% on your snatch pulls, but that actually could be the level of progress or even slower for elite athletes. Then I have fours for my back squats and now we're up to 85%, so we've progressed over time by building volume. And now my three EMOMs that were very position and movement oriented, not a lot of fatigue. Now I'm gonna start just layering in a little bit fatigue. So now it's five sets, 60 second, second row at a 2K pace, 15 toes to bar. So that's heart rate and grip, kind of similar combo to what we saw in 21.3. Rest one minute and then a complex. Now this complex will be varied every week. And my goal would be start at a light load and increase weight every single set. So that way you're not at your limit and you're not at your technical limit. And this gives me the option of training all of these different styles under fatigue and improving somebody's ability to be technical and dialed in when they're increasing their level of fatigue from set to set. So that would be bridge training for that first one. Then performance training is very straightforward. This is basically what most people call programming when they're just putting a wad down on paper, but they're not really doing any progressive training to get to that, so they're just throwing random stuff at their, at their athletes, and if your athletes can cope with that over time, they may get better, but there's no progressive structure to develop a specific level of capacity at a specific skill. So this test that I created was 2159 thrusters chest to bar, which is just chest to bar Fran, rest one minute, 15 muscle up, 30 overhead squat, 15 bar muscle up. So a total of the same style of reps. So in the workout that we saw in 21.3, there was toes to bar, there was chest to bar, there was bar muscle ups, there was 30 muscle ups paired together. So I wanna simulate that same level of fatigue, but maybe not use the same test. We could, which you'll see when we get down to here when we retest 21.1, but it's not necessary. Then after that workout, seven minutes to hit the complex that we saw in 21.4. So gives them the retest of the same complex, different Metcon, different style of workout a little bit instead of being two one minute rests and having three little Metcon portions. So it's different, 
but it's enough similarity that the athlete is getting some exposure to the fatigue lifting and they've had some training to see if you develop the ability to hit a bigger number of that complex under fatigue. So that gives you some sort of an idea of how my off season would develop and progress. That development and progression is how we adapt and get people better. So training, appropriate training, is this process of layering in more simplicity, adding complexity, volume, and loading, and then getting a little bit more complex. Just throwing complex training at people is likely only going to allow your most gifted athletes to get better because they're not actually having any time to develop some of the basic skills and strengths that are required. That's priority number one. Priority number two, shoulder flexion. So this one's a little bit more simple. Some of the principles that you can find here are also on our YouTube channel in our movement archive. If you look up loaded stretching and end range isometrics, you can understand what these are. But I start in my limiter training of just basically stretching and doing end range liftoffs. So an elevated cat stretch for two minutes into some tight hip swings, which is a little bit of dynamic movement in the shoulder to get through flexion and a little bit of uh, closing the shoulder angle under load, and then prone PVC liftoffs, which is laying down on the ground and essentially lifting up into end range shoulder flexion. Going through that series three times. Now as I move closer into my bridge phase, this A series I'm gonna keep in, but I'm gonna reduce, instead of doing three sets of this, I'm just gonna do one set of that series, and now I'm adding a little bit of loading to new series. So I added dumbbell front raises, which is lifting the dumbbells up overhead through shoulder flexion, overhead yoke carries, and straight arm uh, band pull downs, and then jerk recoveries, and um, what is this? <laughs> What did I have here? I don't even remember my own acronym here. Uh, oh, feet elevated back bridge. Sorry, you caught me on a freeze there. Maybe Chris can make me look like less dumb and take it out. Uh, foot elevated back bridge. So we're working on shoulder flexion there. So this is a progression where we're now taking just basic stretching and end range stuff. Now we're adding some loading to the shoulder girdle. And then as we move into performance, there's no real way to test shoulder flexion in performance, we're really testing variables where shoulder flexion and having good shoulder flexion is a competitive advantage. So I will do some basic reassessments. So supine shoulder flexion, seated wall slides, those are basically just looking at somebody's actual biomechanics to see that they've improved from the progressions that we've done. Then I'm testing split jerk, 10RM shoulder to overhead, and 300 foot handstand walk for time. My theory being with this specific athlete, if I improve shoulder flexion, then doing tests that have shoulder flexion in them will get better. So this is my way of kind of moving from limiter bridge into performance. The likelihood too is when you see my template, they're not actually only doing these shoulder flexion things and then retesting and expecting 300 foot handstand walk for time to get better. There will also be other times throughout the week where they're actually doing these actual movements, but this specific variable of my priority, if it gets better, those things should theoretically get better. Then. My last priority, wall walks and double unders because that combo blows me up. Now this is the same thing that you have to be careful of with CrossFitters is that they get exposed on a test, they're very sensitive to that because they're competitive, they wanna get better, they wanna be as high as possible on the leaderboard, then they wanna overdo that specific test. So instead of saying, okay, I'm just gonna train you at wall walks and double unders, I say, okay, well what does this test actually reflect upon in other tests, so that way I can train multiple things. So double unders and hand balancing is a very tough combo. So if you have somebody that struggled on this style of test, they probably also would struggle if it was double unders and strict handstand pushups, or if it was double unders and pushups, or if it was double unders and shoulder to overhead, or if it was double, uh, double unders and split jerks. Anything that pairs that combo of loading the arm overhead and then asking the hands to be have dexterity and move the rope very quickly. So what I try to do here is create some sort of a training model that improves volume of jump roping, 
paired with anything loaded on the hands that then leads me to repeating 21.1. So that way we're not obsessing over the specific test and we are still giving training progressions that allow them to get better at the test. So in my limiter phase, it's a 10 minute AMRAP where I'm rotating through 20 second handstand hold wall facing, then 50 single unders, then 20 second plank hold, 50 speed steps, then 20 second handstand hold away from the wall, and then 25 double unders. 10 minutes of that, rest five minutes, repeat that for three times. The reason why I have single unders and speed steps in here is because doing that style of training, if this were all double unders, would accumulate a very, very high volume of double unders. A lot of people, they can't take that bounding stress, they're not efficient at double unders, so this allows you to create all the different hand balancing things that we wanna create, paired with control of the rope in a lower volume, and if you think about it like endurance training, oftentimes if you wanna get better at running, there'll be two or three days of the week where you're just doing long, slow, easy, continuous running where you're building efficiency and technique. Same type of concept with this style of workout where the single unders are lower intensity than double unders, but they still allow you to get some volume of skill work in with the rope, develop rope control, develop fatigue, and then pair it with all those other movements. As I move into bridge training, then it becomes a little bit more specific to double unders. So three rounds for time, 50 double unders, three wall walks. So that's very similar to the 21.1 stress. Rest one to one. So if this took four minutes, this is gonna be a four minute rest. If this took two minutes, that's gonna be a two minute rest. Then three rounds for time, 50 double unders, 50 foot handstand walk. So that could be another hand balancing combo that's more sports specific. Then rest one to one again. Then three rounds for time, 50 double unders, 10 push-ups. Again, more sports specific, same type of themes of hand balancing, not isolating your training to only work on that wall walk double under combo, but giving them the adaptations that would improve them at double unders and any style of hand balancing. Then as we move into performance training, repeat 21.1, make sure that our training progressions work, and there you have it. Those are all three of the training priorities gives you an illustration of the difference between limiter training, which is more basic, right after your season ends and you get back into training what it should look like, bridge training, which is some period of time after that, again, very dependent on the athletes and how long your athlete is lucky enough to have an off season, and then moving into performance training, which is essentially getting ready for the season. So this could be the two weeks to three months leading into the open or leading into a big off-season competition for an elite athlete. In the classroom, I'll cover a full template of this in the program design review, so check that out. Adam will go through his training for intermediates, Kyle will cover masters, and that is all I have for you. Thank you very much.